Should we turn the lights down there or on the river? Very good. Like that? Okay. Uh, well, hello everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so my name is Erica. She, her pronouns. Um, I'm a doctoral intern here at the Counseling Center this year, and AKA Cupid. <laughs> and today we're going to be talking about dating in college. So just a quick kind of agenda about things we're gonna look over. So we'll talk a bit about um, healthy relationships versus unhealthy relationships and what that looks like and characteristics of that. And then we're gonna talk about the spark phenomenon too. You know, people talk about um, feeling the spark uh, when they're dating, when they're meeting someone new. Um, and there's a lot of interesting research behind that. So we'll talk about that. Um, and we'll talk about communication too, because that's obviously a really important part of dating. And we'll talk about boundaries, and then we'll finish with some resources um, that y'all can look into if you're interested later. Um, so when we're thinking about what is a relationship um, for this presentation, I just kind of wanted to put a disclaimer that everything that we talk about is applicable to all types of relationships. So everything we'll talk about is applicable to committed relationships, exclusive relationships, uh, casual, um, and polyamorous or monogamous relationships. So as we're going through, just kind of keeping in mind that this is applicable to um, all kinds of different relationships. Um, so we could start a bit about talking about healthy versus unhealthy relationships. So we can think about it in like three categories. Um, so with healthy relationships, typically um, it's characterized by respect, um, healthy communication, which we'll talk about a bit more, uh, trust, um, honesty, as well as equality in the between the people involved. And typically you think about how you make decisions together and you can openly discuss um, whatever you're dealing with, um, like sexual like sexual choices or problems in the relationships. And you enjoy spending time together and apart as well. Um, unhealthy relationships, we could characterize that by frequent ruptures. So if you're having a lot of conflict in your relationship, uh, we could consider that unhealthy. Um, dishonesty too, if there's a lot of dishonesty in a relationship. Um, and then power and control issues as well. We can also characterize that as unhealthy. Um, we could think about if one person tries to make most of the decisions, um, that goes to the power and control issues as well. Um, and then with abusive relationships, um, this kind of goes to another level of unhealthy. Um, and so when we think about abusive relationships, we can characterize this with blame shifting. Um, if there's pressure to isolate from friends and family, um, that's considered abusive uh, manipulation. And then any kind of physical uh, violence um, is also considered abusive. So um, I thought it would be interesting to talk about what research says on what makes relationships successful. Um, so there was a recent um, study that explored the question of what it is that makes a relationship successful. And it was published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences. Um, and so they analyzed over 11,000 couples and they tracked them over a year and they tried to measure what it, what it was that predicted the success in the relationships um, in these couples. And just a note to the authors of the study noted that even though they analyzed committed relationships, um, they thought that this, these characteristics could be applied to all kinds of relationships too. 
Um, so they looked at relationship characteristics that best predicted uh, personal satisfaction in a relationship. And they found that um, perceived partner commitment was really important. So how do you, how committed do you perceive your partner is? That was found to be really important. Um, appreciation was also found to be really important. So how you show appreciation for your partner, how do you, you know, telling them that you appreciate them and the things they do for you and things like that, that was found to be a really important predictor. Um, sexual satisfaction was another really important predictor they found. Um, perceived partner satisfaction was also really important. So do you feel like your partner is, sat is um, satisfied in the relationship? That was also found to be really important. So it shows that we really care what our partner thinks and how they're feeling. And that's really important. And then the other thing was the ability to effectively manage conflict. That was also found to be really important. Um, and then they looked at the individual characteristics that best predicted relationship satisfaction. So the, char the characteristics within uh, the individuals in the relationship. Um, and they found that life satisfaction was really important or was a really big predictor. So how satisfied each of the individuals in, in the relationship are with life in general. Um, negative affect and depression, I think these go kind of hand in hand. Um, I think this goes into mood. So um, how they feel on a general basis. And then the quality of relationship attachment was found to be really important as well. Um, so how do they feel attached in a healthy way to their partner? Um, so I talked about how we would be talking about the spark. Um, and I just thought it was interesting because it's something that comes up a lot. So let's say like a scenario, uh, you get home from a first date and your friends ask, how did it go? And you respond, it was okay. I didn't really feel much of a spark. I'm just curious how anyone felt that way a little bit. Yeah, okay. So we'll talk about that because um, it's something that comes up a lot. So uh, for some people, feeling that initial spark might turn into a relationship, um, but the mistake that a lot of people make is thinking that if there isn't that initial spark, um, then this person might not be a good match for you when the opposite could be true. And we could talk about that a bit more. Um, so, but the fact is feeling that initial spark um, is thrilling for a lot of people. Um, it's something that people look for. Um, and not feeling the spark can feel to can lead to feelings of disappointment and decisions to not pursue certain relationships. Um, and I think, you know, when we're thinking about this, we can think about like the media, like Hollywood and movies and what they show about what relationships um, look like and what the media shows in terms of the spark and like that can really influence our expectations, you know, when we're dating, like the I just knew feelings, you know, as soon as I met them kind of thing. Um, so I think that plays a role too. So uh, we'll go into seven reasons why um, people that you go on dates with, if you don't feel that initial spark, um, why they might still be a good match for you. And this is based on research. Um, so the first reason is to think about is if you find yourself attracted to the same kind of partner without success. Um, so a lot of research shows that a lot of us have a dating type. Um, and if you're repeatedly dating the same kind of person without success, um, you may be feeling an initial spark with people that aren't really a good match for you or aren't compatible. Um, for example, if one or both of your parents were emotionally unavailable and you find yourself attracted to people who are emotionally unavailable, um, this is a pattern to take into consideration. Um, as we're dating and thinking about the spark. Um, and then the second reason is uh, your connection with someone can really grow over time. And there's something called the mere exposure effect um, in psycholo psychological research. Um, and it's basically a phenomenon that um, found that the more exposure you have to something you feel neutral about, um, over time, the more likely to, you're, you're to have positive feelings about it. So we're thinking about things that we feel neutral about, not necessarily like negative, but um, if you feel like neutral about someone, the more exposure you have to them, the more likely you have to, you'll have positive feelings about them 
over time. So that's something to take into consideration. Um, and then the other thing is that there is room to grow a strong foundation without being blinded by the spark. Um, so when, you, when you're very attracted to someone initially, um, which happens to almost everyone, uh, you're more likely to overlook maybe like red flags or things that um, signs that you might not be compatible. Um, so, and then you might also have difficulty being your true self because of nerves and all that kind of thing. So that's something to take into consideration. Um, and then the fourth reason is that you or they may be a slow burn person, which basically just means that it takes time to feel comfortable around someone and to feel like your authentic self, or maybe it takes time for them to get comfortable with you and feel like their authentic selves, which affects how you are with each other. Um, so that's something to take into consideration too, that some people just might be like slow to warm up, but they might still be really good potential candidates uh, for dating. So something to think about. <clears throat> and then the fifth reason is there might be other factors that might be influencing your feelings about a first date or like your first interaction with someone. Like for example, like nerves, like whether you're nervous or they're nervous, or maybe you're both nervous. Um, that's definitely going to impact, you know, how you feel about them. Um, so that's something to take into consideration. And then there might be other factors too. <coughs> okay. And then the sixth reason is that um, that you might still be a good match, even if you didn't feel that spark, is if you have like similar values to them. Um, if you find yourself feeling like y'all are both interested in similar things and you want similar things in life. Um, you know, that's another thing to take into consideration. Um, and then the last reason that they talked about in the article was um, maybe having a pattern of being avoidant of true intimacy. So um, some people might hold on to a fantasy in, in a sense of what love should look like um, in order to kind of protect yourself from experiencing that true vulnerable um, intimacy. Um, and you might find yourself feeling a spark only with people that turn out to be emotionally unavailable again, um, for example. So that's something to take into consideration as a pattern um, when you're thinking about like relationship strategy and like who you want to date and that kind of thing. Um, so we'll talk a bit about communication. Um, and I just came up with some things. I mean, there's a lot of things to think about uh, communicating wise when you're dating. Um, but when we're thinking about what are some important things to communicate, definitely like your intentions, like what are you looking for? Um, so that to make sure that y'all are on the same page and you're kind of in agreement with what you're doing. Um, and so I think that's really important. And then the boundaries too, uh, which we'll talk more about, the like physical and emotional boundaries, that's really important to communicate because um, people can't necessarily know what you don't communicate. So that's important. And then what your values are too, um, because if y'all have similar values, um, that will be helpful, you know, in thinking about uh, if you're compatible and that kind of thing. Uh, if you don't have similar values, that's something to think about too. Um, and then how you like to give and receive affection. I think that's something that's important to communicate too. Um, you know, how you, like when we think about the five love languages, if anyone's heard of that, uh, has anyone heard of that? Yeah. So the five love languages are like physical touch, um, uh, words of affirmation, uh, quality time. So like spending time with someone. Um, and then I forget what the last one was, but there's lots of ways that we can give and receive affection. Um, and I think it's important to communicate that because you might not, you might uh, like to receive affection differently than whoever it is that you're dating. Um, and so they might not know that, you know. Um, so I think that's important. Uh, so we'll go through two uh, communication tools that you can use. I think this applies to dating and just like relationships in general, like friendships or whatever. Um, so the first relationship tool that we'll go over is called give. Um, and it's for when you're wanting to express your wants, your needs, um, and to assist in maintaining those like positive relationships. 
Um, and so the first part of give is being gentle. Um, so when you're communicating, thinking about like being gentle in the way that you're communicating. Um, and when, what research has shown that the top indicator of gentleness is tone. So when you're communicating, uh, having a gentle tone can really make a big difference. Um, the second part with the eye is showing interest by actively listening. So showing them that you're really listening to what they're saying. Um, v is the validating the person's feelings, their wants and opinions by repeating it back. So one way to help people feel heard is by um, kind of paraphr paraphrasing, uh, making sure that you heard correctly. Um, that's one technique to do that. And then using an easy manner by being soft in your approach. And I think it's similar to the G and being gentle, uh, but being easy in your manner when you're communicating. And this can be useful for when you're feeling distracted because you know we're all we all sometimes have bad days and we're busy. And this might be this might be really easy sometimes, but then there are times where it might not be easy. And when you're having more conflict with your partner, this could be useful um, to just kind of like bring you bring attention to that and being intentional with how you are communicating. So this is a tool um, that you can use. And then we'll talk about one more tool. I'll show the video. And so the next tool is Dear Man. Um, and it's when you want to ask something from someone and maintain a good relationship. Um, so it's very similar, but a bit different. And it can be helpful in resolving conflict as well as saying no. Sometimes it can be really hard for people to say no. Um, and so this is a useful tool. I'm just trying to make it bigger. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dear Man is an acronym in the Interpersonal Effectiveness DPT Skills. Dear Man skills teach you how to ask for something from someone while still maintaining a good relationship with that person. It's also a skill that can help you resolve conflicts and effectively say no when you need to. Each letter is a reminder of how to implement this skill in a conversation. The D in Dear Man reminds you to describe. First, let's set up the conversation by only stating the facts about it. You're not going to ask for, reject, or give an opinion at this point. You're just going to set up the facts about the situation so you and the other person are both on the same page. The E stands for express. After setting up the conversation, you want to express your feelings and understanding of it. This is best done by using I statements to take accountability for yourself and your emotions, and to keep the other person from becoming defensive in the conversation. A stands for assert. You've set up the facts and expressed your feelings and understanding of the situation. Now, it's time to be clear and assert or ask for what you do or do not want. Be direct. Don't beat around the bush or assume the other person knows what you're talking about. They can't read your mind. You need to clearly state exactly what you want so there's no misunderstanding. The R stands for reinforce. Whether you're making a request or turning one down, be sure to reinforce the relationship between you and the other person. Acknowledge that the relationship is important to you and express how you'll feel about them regardless of the outcome. The M in man stands for mindful. Try to be fully present and focused on the current issue you're resolving. Don't fall into the trap of bringing up past events or overpromising the future. Use mindfulness to stay on topic and avoid going off on a rant. And of course, ignore the distractions from your phone or your environment. A in man stands for appear confident. Look the part, sit up or stand up straight and make eye contact with the person you're speaking to. This lets the other person know that you're taking this conversation seriously and that you're confident you should get what you're asking for. And finally, N stands for negotiate. During this conversation, remember that you're trying to make the situation a win-win for yourself and the other person. 
Make your offer more appealing if the other person is not on board with the outcome. Using the Dear Man DBT skill can feel a bit awkward at first, but keep practicing. It'll be worth the effort to learn how to resolve conflicts and ask for things in a way that keeps a good relationship between you and those you love. So given Dear Man are tools that um, if you want to look it up later, it's all over the internet. Um, okay, our stress level is off the charts and our anxiety is like, hello, any ideas? Workaholic Kristen, just stay. Sorry. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's useful for, you know, when you're in, these are skills that might be easier to us when we're feeling good and we're not stressed and that kind of thing. But I think it's, you know, when we're having conflict and when we're stressed and there's a lot going on, that's when things become more difficult. So referring to tools can be useful during those times, I think. And we'll talk a bit more about conflict resolution later. So just wanted to talk a bit about communication because it's something that comes up a lot in dating. Um, and another thing that comes up a lot is ghosting, uh, something that's talked about a lot. Um, I, just, has anyone here ever been ghosted? Yeah. Has anyone here ever ghosted anyone? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think we've all, well, most of us have probably done it at some point. I mean, I know I've done it too in the past and um, that kind of thing. So um so there's a hinge has a relationship science director and she's a psychologist um and she does re research on dating and uh her name is logan Uri, and she does research on dating and she uses hinge as a way to do research um and so she looked at uh data on hinge and she did a study involving hinge users um and just kind of asked them about ghosting and how they felt about it and that kind of thing um, and so she found that 91% of Hinge users say they have been ghosted. So like most people, right? Um, which I'm not too surprising. Um, and then 40% said they ghost. Uh, she asked them why they ghost. And 40% said they ghost because they don't know how to explain their feelings. Um, and then she also asked them about like, would you prefer being ghosted or would you prefer uh, being told like being quote unquote rejected? Um, and so when they asked, um, apparently 80% said, tell me rejection hurts, but I'd rather know. So it seems like most people prefer not being ghosted, um, like being told that they're quote unquote rejected. It sounds like a harsh term, but um, so it seems like most people would rather know. Um, so it's just something that I thought was interesting. Um, and when we're thinking about this, I think there's a lot of good reasons, uh, I would say, not to ghost. And one of them is, you know, even if you're in a relationship with someone that you do want to be with, there are times where you're going to have to tell them things that are hard, you know, like set boundaries. You're going to have to have hard conversations. So you could think about telling someone um, that you're not interested as practicing uh, communication skills, because that's basically what you're doing. You're uh, practicing the communication skills. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. Um, and so, you know, one thing to think about doing that something I've seen people do that I think is helpful for some people is um, anti-ghosting text. So having something like on your phone, like ready, you know, to kind of make it easier or like having a friend help you make a script for a text to send, you know. Um, I think we're probably talking about people that we've actually been on dates with, uh, you know, people that have taken time out of their day to like meet you and things like that. Um, and, you know, saying just something like, hey, I've enjoyed hanging out with you and getting to know you, but I think we are looking for different things and I wish you all the best. You know, it's like very clear. Um, it's like ending um, and it's, you know, short and sweet. And then, or something like, hey, I've enjoyed hanging out and getting to know you, but I did not feel the connection I'm looking for. I appreciate your time and interest and, you know, wish you all the best. And obviously you can make it whatever feels right for you. That's just what I came up with. Um, but it's just something to think about. Um, so when thinking about communication, like boundaries is like really important. Um, and I would say that's like whether you're casually dating or in a committed relationship um, or any type of relationship, boundaries are important. 
Um, and it's, it's not just like how you set boundaries, it's also like respecting boundaries. Um, and so it's important to feel like you're comfortable to you feel comfortable expressing your wants, your fears, your goals, and what your limits are without fear. Um, like that fear part comes up a lot um, for lots of different reasons. Um, and then, you know, when I think we talk a lot about like setting boundaries, but I think it's also important to think about how do you receive boundaries? Like when someone sets a boundary with you, how do you react? Um, I think that's also important to think about when you're, when we're talking about dating and boundaries and all that. Um, so one type of boundary uh, that I think is very relevant for dating is emotional boundaries. And when we're thinking about emotional boundaries, uh, time apart versus time together, I think that's really a big one, you know, because some people um, might need more time apart, especially if they've got a lot going on, whereas another partner might want more time together. So that's an area where boundaries come up. Um, emotional support, that's another area too. Um, obviously, emotional support is a big part of relationships, um, but you know what, what are the boundaries that you have around that? Um, and then trust too. And then um, just some, some examples of emotional boundaries uh, that I just kind of came up with, you know, around like communication, for example. Like I'm okay with regular texting, but I don't want to text multiple times an hour. Um, if that's like a boundary for you, not being able to text um, that much. And I need quiet time to myself every day. Um, that's another like emotional boundary too, I would say, where you're needing like time for yourself. And then physical boundaries too, that's obviously really important. Um, I think consent comes up a lot here, what your sexual wants and desires are, what your sexual limits are. These are really important boundaries to communicate and to receive. Um, and then the pace of a relationship too, um, and sexual pace. Um, and then an example I kind of came up with for that is, you know, I'm comfortable with some touching, but I'm not ready to have sex. And that's, that's clear. And that's definitely a physical boundary. Um, so I said we would talk a bit about conflict resolution. And I think the two tools that we talked about really um, a lot of what came up there will apply here too. Um, but this is just kind of like what research uh, showed was helpful in conflict resolution in relationships. And the first one um, was being direct. Um, so, you know, sometimes people don't just want to come out and plainly state that what is bothering them um, and instead might be more indirect or passive. Um, and that's something that's been found to cause more issues long-term in relationships. So typically being direct is something that's been found to be helpful in conflict resolution. Um, and then the second one was uh, talking directly, talk about your feelings without blaming. Um, so, you know, instead of saying something like you're totally irrational, uh, trying something like, I feel irritated uh, when you claim I'm flirting with someone during an innocent conversation. Um, so that's not calling someone ir irrational, but it's expressing your feelings, which is so important. And then another one, which I think is really important, is avoiding never and always. And that's something that comes up a lot in arguments between couples. Um, like saying something like, you're always staring at your cell phone, or you never help me out around the house. Um, typically it's been found that using like the never and always, it kind of feels more like a character attack or a very personal. Um, and usually it's not the case that someone is like always, like it's not usually like black and white. Um, so typically it's recommended to avoid those kinds of always and never statements. Um, and it tends to make people defensive, like, cause I said, it makes, kind of feels like a character attack. Um, and then the fourth is focusing on one issue at a time. And that's something that comes up a lot in uh, conflict among people that are dating. If um, they're having an argument, like bringing up arguments from the past, because um, then that just becomes into like one big argument and we're not really solving things if we're bringing other things in, on the table. Um, so that's something that's important to think about. And then the other thing is like really listening, which is something that can become, might be more natural at times. But when you're having an argument, um, people are not feeling good, gets more difficult. So really being intentional. And there's like two strategies to think about when you wanna show someone that you're listening to them. 
And this could be helpful for a lot of different situations, but paraphrasing is one that's really helpful. So like um, kind of repeating what the person said in a different way, like using your own words and repeating what they're saying to make them feel heard. And then the other one is perception checking. Like, I think you're, I think you're feeling this way or you're saying that you're seeing it this way. Is that right? Like, am I getting it right? So it kind of shows that you care, um, that you're like really wanting to understand their perspective and stuff. Um, and then the sixth one is avoiding automatically objective, objectifying your partner's complaints. Um, so when you're criticized, it's hard not to get defensive, but defensiveness doesn't tend to solve problems. Um, so like, you know, if we imagine like a couple, for example, uh, arguing because the wife wants her husband to do more chores around the house. Um, and when she suggests that he does like a quick cleanup, he gets ready to leave in the morning and he says, yes, that would help, but I really don't have time this morning. And when she suggests that he set aside time on the weekend, uh, he says, yes, but that could take away that, but that would be a way to schedule it. But we usually have plans on the weekends and I have work to catch up on and et cetera. The yes, budding behavior suggests that her ideas and views are not worthwhile. So he's kind of just like invalidating like everything that she's putting on the table. Um, and so that's seen as like not being that productive. Um, the seventh, um, the seventh point was trying to take a different perspective. Um, so in addition to listening to your partner, like taking time to take their perspective and try to understand where it is they're coming from. Um, and there's research that shows that those who can take perspective, their partner's perspective, are li less likely to become angry during the conflict. Uh, because that means that maybe you have like more understanding and empathy around that. Um, and then the eighth one was avoid showing contempt for your partner. Um, so contempt, um, of all the negative things you can do and say during the conflict, the worst uh, one to found might is uh, contempt. Um, so there was research that found that the top predictor of divorce uh, among couples was contempt. And contemptuous remarks are like those remarks that kind of belittle someone. Um, so like maybe saying disrespectful things or like name calling, um, and it can also be nonverbal, like rolling your eyes um, and things like that, or smirking. Um, that those are all considered contempt, and it was found to be like a top predictor of divorce um, among couples in the study. So I think that's pretty important. Um, and then the ninth reason, the ninth tip was, um, you know, trying to have more positive behaviors than negative. Um, so when we're thinking about positive behaviors in a couple. Uh, we think about like humor, uh, good nature, uh, warmth, collaboration, like those things that are you know positive in a relationship, like showing affection, um, any kind of positive behavior you can think of in a relationship. Um, that's um, what it's referring to. And then negative would be like the opposite of that, like any kind of conflict or um, some any kind of thing that feels negative in a relationship. So um, what research says about that is that um, the magic number, so to speak, for a ratio is five to one for like relationship success. So having basically five positive behaviors to one negative behavior. So basically you wanna aim to have like more positive behaviors than negative behaviors. When the ratio starts being more negative to positive, then that's when things get a little tricky. Um, and then the 10th tip was like knowing when to take space, which makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, if you're feeling like in the heat of things, it could be a good idea to take space um, and come back to things later. So, um, and then something else I thought would be good to talk about, because um, I think it's important, it's like values, um, like dating values. And I think it's something to think about, you know, as you're dating and, um, communicating with people, like what are your values, what are their values, um, and something you just kind of get to know about people as you get to know them. Um, but <clears throat> there was research that looked at like what were important values that led to like relationship success and trust was found to be really important. 
So it's really important for emotional safety. Um, there are ways to build trust. There's ways to rebuild trust after trust is broken. Um, but without trust, it, it'd be hard to be vulnerable in relationships, which is really important. Um, and then communication. So that involves like honesty, respect, and consent, and all those things and things that we've talked about. Um, <clears throat> the other one was patience, like how much patience do you show your partner or people that you're dating? Um, and then empathy was found to be really important too. So empathy is like, you know, being able to understand how other people are feeling and what their, their perspective and things like that. Um, so being willing to take another perspective, even if you don't agree with it, like just being willing to acknowledge it and, and see it um, is really important. Um, and then affection too, uh, affection and interest, like how you show your affection, like going back to how you show appreciation for someone, because that was found to be really important, as I was talking about before. Um, and then being flexible too, because obviously like compromise is going to be a really important thing um, in dating and relationships. Um, so that was found to be important. And then uh, room for growth. So just like the acknowledgement, I guess, that people change um, and like allowing people to grow as individuals um, and that kind of thing. And then respect. Um, and then reciprocity, I think, is a really important one, too. It just goes into that give and take, you know, that it kind of naturally works out equally um, that people aren't like you're not like, keeping score like, oh, I did this for you. So you have to do that for me. Um, but that there's like give and take and it feels natural and it feels like pretty much equal. Um, that was found to be pretty important too. Um, and so lastly, we'll just go through some resources. Um, so I, I found this um, organization, I think they're actually based out of Austin. Like they're called Love is Respect and it's a national resource to prevent unhealthy and abusive relationships too. Um, and it's directed at young people. Um, and so I put their website there and they're called Love is Respect and they have a lot of resources on their website. Um, and they also have live chat options if you wanna to talk to someone about relationship issues that are coming up or that might be concerning, particularly in areas of abuse and things like that. Um, so it's just something I wanted to share. And then, and then I also just wanted to talk about the Counseling Center because this presentation is being put on by the Counseling Center. Um, so, uh, it, you know, the Counseling Center is a resource for you and you can check out our website. Um, we have a lot of like uh, mental health videos under self-help resources. Um, so that's an option too. And then we have something called Therapy Assistance Online. And it's basically, and there's like a um, QR code there if you want to look it up, but it's basically a online mental health resource that you can use your credentials to log in. Um, and it's free. And it just has a lot of different videos on lots of different mental health topics like anxiety, depression. I'm pretty sure they have relationship stuff too. Um, so you can kind of learn a lot through that. So um, that's an option too. And then uh, lastly, I just, you know, if anyone has any, like, I just want to say thank you uh, for coming. I think this is a really important topic and I'm passionate about it and I hope it was helpful. Um, and I just wonder if anyone has any questions or comments, uh, you know, I just want to give space for that. Um, if, if anyone wants to share. Or people online too, you can type. <laughs> Okay. Well, okay. And then you still have to do the feedback. Yes, okay. that's okay. Um, so yeah, feel free to, if you have any questions or comments, just go ahead. And then also I, there's a feedback survey. So um, before you leave, I'll just ask that you please uh, fill out the survey. So you can use the QR code um, and then fill out an evaluation that won't take too much time. <laughs> And then I'll also be here. So if anyone wants to come talk to me after the presentation, I'll be here. And then my people online, you'll actually have this survey when you exit out. Um, so if you already did scan it, that's okay too, but it will come up for you. Okay. And then my people on Zoom, thank you so much for coming. That 
concludes our presentation.